But at any rate, I'm looking here. Marsha, Lynn are here. Deb Campbell from Minnesota. Nice to see you. Mike Isley's here. Okay, here come the Beckhams. People are starting to come in. Lindsay is here, Ingalls. And we are going to, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a session on Abraham and what's unique with Abraham and his whole story. We're going to have a lot of fun exploring that story because Abraham was the first Ivri, the first Hebrew. And uh, what are the implications of that? And how is he connected with the Jewish people? And how is he connected to the world? Because Yishmael came from Abraham. So he's the father of the Arab world as well. So we're going to have a lot of fun. That's in a couple of weeks from now. That'll be an open session, most likely. And I'm planning on doing another uh, closed session just for subscribers next week before Shavuot, because we, ha we, we didn't do everything. Whoever was here for the first session, we didn't finish. We want to talk about what, what, did, what was really given at Sinai, right? Was it the tablets? Was it the Ten Commandments? Was it, what was it? What was it? We say Torah, but what does that mean? They got the Torah, because the book, the five books of Moses, wasn't finished until 40 years later at the end of Moses' life, before they came into land. So what does it mean we got Torah at Sinai? So next week we're going to have a session on that for people who are subscribers. But now it's 7 p.m. in, Yerush in Yerushalayim, in Israel, live. And uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm here with my dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Ken Spiro. And we've known each other for over 35 years. He is a uh, noted speaker, he's a, an historian, he's written many books. I'm just gonna share my screen here. All right, so here's a Rabbi Ken. Um, okay, thank you. He is, um, he studied at Vassar College, got his BA in Russian language, and went on to the Pushkin Institute, did postgraduate studies during the Cold War, and he's got wild stories. He was up here for Shabbat, and he told me some wild stories about being followed by the KGB and trying to help the Jewish community there. Uh, maybe we can get him to speak about that one time. Uh, but he did get ordination from Asha Torah, where I got ordination, and uh, we became rabbis together. He speaks all around the world. He's written books on uh, Jewish history, Crash Course in Jewish History. If anybody of you are interested in it, I highly recommend you do it as a series of videos on his website. He's also written a bunch of books. Uh, here, I'll just show you the books. Ken, you'll see better. Here's his latest book, Destiny, also dealing with the history of the Jewish people. And uh, here's his crash course in Jewish history. And uh, I don't want to spend any more time because we want to hear from him. I'm going to have the link for you to go to his website later, and uh, you'll be able to browse, browse everything that he has over there. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask Ken to discuss why we're here. What's so special about Jerusalem? Why are we celebrating it here? Is it a real festival? Is it a holiday? What are we supposed to learn from this day? So uh, what do you say? Okay. Ken? Well, first of all, Shmuel, thank you so much for uh, having me join you. It was a pleasure. We're hanging out last weekend. We were up in Tiberias. Tiberia and uh, Yavniel, where it was like 114 degrees. So now I'm sitting in the air-conditioned department in the old city of Jerusalem. So it doesn't get better than that in terms of uh, your, um, I'm speaking to you right from the uh, spiritual epicenter of the world. Just a little background to Jerusalem Day is not a holiday in the Torah. It's a modern Israeli holiday. It's celebrating the reunification of Jerusalem. Remember, for 2,000 years, from the destruction of the temple, and we'll talk about that later, until uh, the third day of the Six-Day War, June 7th, 1967, there was no, Jerusalem was a divided city for the 19 years from 48 to 67, but the Jewish people did not have sovereignty over our political and spiritual capital. So we're now at 53 years since that day, which will actually be celebrated tonight, um, Jewish calendar, the, the new day begins at nighttime, so it actually works out to uh, the 28th of the month of ER is, uh, is, is Jerusalem Day. 
and we're, we hold by the, it was actually June 7th, but we go by the Jewish calendar. So it doesn't exactly jive. It also happens to be in terms of Jewish trivia. What else happened on this day? This is the yort site of Samuel the prophet. This is the commemoration day that Samuel the prophet passed away. And there certainly must be a connection in there because he is a pivotal figure in the establishment of the monarchy of uh, King David and the making Jerusalem the capital of the Jewish people the first time almost 3,000 years ago. So I, as, as you know, uh, Shmuel talked about my background a little. I'm originally from New York, by the way. I've been in Israel for more than 38 years. Uh, I am, I wear many hats, as I say. I wear my little Jewish hat, but in my Jewish hat, I have, I am a rabbi. I actually don't work as a rabbi. I work primarily, unless I'm visiting different communities, and then I rabbi there, take a break, and I take over. But I work primarily as a, a speaker, a historian, and a tour guide. But I love to combine my Jewish worldview with the history to get that big picture. And this is a great time to talk about Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem so important to the Jewish people? Uh, you know, what is the connection? What's the history? Because so much standing what's going on, even with the geopolitical realities of today and, and what happened in the U.S. recognizing Jerusalem as the capital and United Nations and resolutions, it all goes back to to understanding. And not just the Jewish people's connection, but the world has a connection to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is also a holy city for Christianity and Islam. And in the course of talking about our history of Jerusalem, we're going to also understand what is the connection of the, the world and not just the Jewish people to the holy city. In back of me, the background I chose is, uh, this is Jaffa Gate. If you lean over there, there's the Jaffa Gate, um, a rare picture taken during coronavirus when no one on the streets, usually it's packed with people. It was quite like a town, especially. Um, but these are the new walls of the old city. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have been to uh, Israel, but, you know, living in America, old and new have very different connotations. In America, you have a 1956 Eisenhower period linoleum floor in your kitchen. Your house is like ancient and has a, a national, you know, it's like a national landmark. As the British would say, you know, American history is an oxymoron. <laughs> it's just two words that don't go together, you know. Um, but in Israel, a thousand years old is not even middle-aged. So two, three thousand, four thousand years old is really old. But when we're looking at, uh, oh, I see someone popped in there. When we're looking at, uh, at the old walls of the new city, these are the Ottoman Turkish walls that go back to 1540. And that again, by is Jerusalem time is, is new. But I want to get in our time capsule, travel back to the very beginning. Now, I know that um, uh, Shmuel created a really good historical timeline we're going to go through uh, and use as a visual aid as we are uh, going through our material. Right now, I'm just seeing a big picture of Terry Samuelson there and Noah. Okay. Okay. Um, but let's go back to the beginning. Let's get in our time capsule. Travel back. Well, now we have, okay. Travel back to the ancient world. That's a beautiful picture of the sea you got there. Um, right. Travel back to the ancient world. When we talk about the history of Jerusalem, the only people, and we have to understand first and foremost, before we dive into our story, that Jews are not just a religion. Judaism is much more than just a religion. The Jewish people are a nation. We have a land, language, and a history. And although for much of Jewish history, especially the last 2,000 years, the majority of Jews have been scattered around the world, didn't necessarily speak Hebrew as a language, um, had very different cultures and historical experiences, the further back we go in time, closer the Jewish connection is, until eventually we all end up back at one place at one time, which is what we're going to be celebrating a week from now at Shavuot, the holiday of Shavuot. We all stood at Mount Sinai uh, and received the Torah, and as Shmuel said, he's going to do a class on that. But if we just focus on Jerusalem, the only people who can claim to be more indigenous to the Jewish people than the Jewish people to the land of Israel would be a people called the Canaanites, in Hebrew, the Canaani. And it's a generic term that's used to describe actually seven different groups of people that, inherit, that inhabited the land of Israel going back thousands of years ago to what we call the Middle Bronze Period. Because ancient world in the Middle East, we define periods of time. You know, today we have BC, before cell phones. 
and after cell phones as a period, a way of defining the world. But in the ancient world, way before the common era and before the common, before the common era, we defined periods of times by the metal technology that was used. Stone Age, then Copper Age, then Bronze Age, then Iron Age. Which, by the way, as an interesting little aside, you've heard the expression, the idiom, to have the edge in technology. It comes exactly from this point. As metal technology improves, the, the quality and the darkness of your tools and your weapons got better and better. But 3,700 years ago, which is when our story starts, and at that period of time, the Jewish people are in Egypt. This is when we go from a family to a nation before the Passover Exodus narrative. But at that period of time, and for hundreds of years before, the initial indigenous population of the land were Canaanites. And again, it's seven different nations, the Jebusites, the Prezites, the Hittites. And, and there was 31 city-states described in the Bible. We see 31 little city-states. It means that every city was a mini-state. If you want to look at Renaissance period, like Italy, you get the same. You had Genoa, and you had Florence, and you had Naples, and you had Rome. Different cities. It was their own little country. So you had seven different peoples that are generically called Canaanites living in 31 city-states in the land of Israel. And by the way, the biblical boundaries of Israel are not actually the international boundaries as recognized today. And Jerusalem was one of those city-states. So again, those Canaanites ceased to exist literally thousands and thousands of years ago. But those are the only people who could be more indigenous to Israel than the Jewish people. But if we go, but the Jewish connection to the land first begins with the Abraham narrative. And the Abraham narrative goes back to this period of 3,700 years ago. Abraham will himself be an Iraqi. He's great up from Iraq into the land of Israel, which at the time is called Canaan. And then God will tell him to go to the land. And Abraham will settle in the land. And if you read the biblical narrative, the Bible stories in Genesis and Bereshit, you'll see that they all take place in the southern part of the country. But it's in Genesis chapter 12 is the first reference we see to Jerusalem in the Bible. And by the way, in the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there is no name of any place called Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. The earliest name of the place is Jerusalem is it's only going to start to be cut used out, in the book of Joshua. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I said the, uh, the, the name end, that was the, used. The, the first name that was used. Right. The name that is used in the book of Genesis in Bereshit and through the five books of Moses is going to be Shalem or Moya, Moriah. And uh, by the way, there's a lot of places in America to name, name Salem with anglicized version of that exact name, as there are things like Shiloh and Moriah and you name it. There's plenty of place names around the world, especially America. But in, the, in Genesis chapter 12, we have the story of Abraham going to rescue his nephew Lot. There was a war of four kings against five kings, and Abraham's Lot is taken captive, and Abraham rescues him. And Abraham will come back. Uh, and it will come to the city of Shalem. And Malkitzedek, the king of Shalem, will come out to greet him. This is the first time we see the, a reference to Jerusalem. But the first reference to Jerusalem as a place that is significant to the Jewish people or the proto-Jewish people, meaning Abraham, because before we're a big nation, we're just, just a family. And before we're a family, we're the personal belief system of Abraham and his wife, Sarah, is in Genesis chapter 22. When God says to Abraham, and you can see right here, we're looking at Genesis chapter 2, you know, he says, Kach et bincha. He says, take your son, your only son, love, and go to, and it says, if you see highlighted in bold, Eretz Hamoriah, the land of Moriah, and offer him up there upon one of the uh, heights that I will point out to you. So Abraham saddles his donkey, and he's down by Beersheba. He travels for three days. Today, it's like an hour and a half drive. But back mm -hmm. then, it's a long schlep on a donkey. And on the third day, he's the place from afar. What's the place he sees? We don't get a detailed description, but he sees what, which is called Mount Moriah. The bottom of the hill was probably inhabited by Canaanites. The upper part of the hill is empty. Now, a little interesting aside, why did the Canaanites choose to live at the bottom? To an interesting point about, you know, we live today in an, er in, a, in an era of tremendous comfort. We have indoor plumbing, running water, food, you know, in the ancient world, and even in the third world today, 
water is a very big issue. In the land of Israel, it doesn't rain for half the year. So if you want to establish any kind of settlement, especially you have to be near a water supply. And it so happens that at the lower part, the southern end of Mount Moriah, uh, further down the side of the hill was a spring called the Spring On, the Shiloach, as it's called, the Mei Shiloach, the waters of the Shiloach. And this spring is the largest karstic spring in Judean hills. It pumps 1,800 cubic meters of water a day. So the Jebusites, the Canaanites living, will build their city at the lower part of that hill. But what Abraham is interested in is the upper part of the hill. And that's the spot. And if you want to reference that today, and we'll see some images as we scroll through uh, our little timeline here. But for those of you who are familiar with Israel and been to the old city, that is the spot that is underneath the gold dome, the dome of the rock today, behind the western wall. The you gold dome it. is you actually see it up here, behind yeah, me. Yeah, you see it in, in, behind the in behind behind the Shmuel's head. You'll see a picture of it as the western wall plaza. By the way, today this whole hill is more or less hidden, especially the upper part, because of all the construction, destruction, reconstruction. You don't see too much of it. The western wall is a retaining wall built around the upper part of that hill. But it's that upper part of that hill underneath the gold dome, and, in, and it's called the Dome of the Rock. In Arabic, Kubat al-Sahra, or Hebrew, Kipa al sela because there's an exposed piece of bedrock. The highest part of the hill is where that Binding of Isaac story takes place. Now, people always ask me, because I'm tour guiding there all the time, you know, why did Abraham pick the spot? And I always ask, he didn't. God picked the spot. And then they say, why did God pick the spot? And I say, you got to ask God. But reality is, in, is in, in Jewish consciousness, in the mind of the creator of the universe, this is the ultimate high speed download site. This is the nexus, the meeting place between the physical and the mental. This is where you get the best connectivity. Like well, I always use the example when your people are touring around, you want to check their WhatsApp messages or their Facebook page. They go look, look for the free Wi Fi. And certain places have better look for the number of bars that light up on your phone, or the little circles that are lighting up. So, you know, if you're living outside the land of Israel, you got very poor reception. When you're in the land of Israel, the reception is pretty decent. But when you're standing in Jerusalem and you're on that spot, it is lit up. You got maximum connectivity. This is the place to connect. It is intrinsically holy. And therefore, we'll see, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, it will be the logical place to, to build the permanent version of what is the holiest world for the Jewish people. Now, some Jews think that's a buffet table. It's actually not true. It was love to eat. The holiest object in the world for the Jewish people is called the tabernacle, which in Hebrew was called the Mishkan. And when we leave Egypt, after the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, which will be commemorated by the day of Shavuot in just a week's time, God says to the Jewish people, Vasuli Make for me a dwelling place and I will dwell amongst you. And we're commanded to make this prefacated structure. It's a tent with two rooms. The outer room is called the Holy, the Kadosh, and the called the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And there's a courtyard around it. And there was an altar for sacrifices built outside. And this was a prefabricated structure that was built in the desert, constructed, broken down, schlepped to different places for the 40 years we wandered in the desert. And then the Jewish people will enter the land of Israel. It would be in many different locations we'll talk about a little later. But when we finally build a permanent version of it, on, the, on that spot, the top of the mountain, it's no longer known as the Mishkan, it's known as the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. So the temple is that permanent version. So what you essentially have is an intrinsically holy spot. And on top of that, you build an incredible holy structure. By the way, I don't want to do a class on the text, it's not our topic, but it's not a museum, it's not a portable synagogue, it's like the motherboard, the mainframe, the power supply of connectivity individually and collectively for not just the Jewish people, but the whole world. Because it says in the Bible, my house is a house of prayer for the entire human race. This is not from where spirituality like sort of descends and emanates to the world. It's the ultimate place. So it, but it's, we have to appreciate we're dealing with the Temple Mount. The Temple had for a long time, and we'll talk about that, but the, that spot is intrinsically holy to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are kind of Jerusalem obsessed.
So with or without a Jew, with or without Jewish sovereignty over Jerusalem that we've had in the last 53 years, with or without a temple being there that we don't have yet, maybe we'll get lucky, Shmuel, and by the end of the class, we'll get like this flash news, temp third to rebuilt, in which case the Messiah is here and we better all get plane tickets quick. But that place is intrinsically holy. Jews are Jerusalem obsessed people. By the way, the word Jerusalem, is 667 times in the Hebrew Bible, according to my software program. I didn't count. Uh, I think Zion is mentioned, which is another name. It says, from Zion will go forth Torah. Ki mitzion se te Torah. Today, there's a place called Mount Zion outside the Jewish quarter, but that was incorrectly named by a medieval Muslim writer a thousand years ago. Mount Zion is Mount Moriah. It's the Temple Mount. It's the same spot. Okay, Moriah Shalem, close to 900 times we talk about Jerusalem. And wherever we are in the world as Jews, we're always facing that spot. Okay, we're facing Israel. And in Israel, you face, a lot of Jews think it's the Western Wall. The Western Wall is just a retaining wall built a little over 2,000 years ago to make a platform around the top of the hill to end the, the temple platform area. But the one and only holy spot, and you can see in Shmuel's picture right to the right to the side of his head, the left, is you can see that gold dome. There's the Western Wall, beautiful illustration. Underneath that, that is the place historically. Pick the good background there. It's been very helpful for us. That's the place historically that Abraham offers, again, because God says that's the place, intrinsically holy. So now we understand that Jerusalem has a unique place in the heart of the Jewish people. By the way, if you've ever been to a traditional Jewish wedding, some not so traditional Jewish weddings, they break a glass at the wedding. Now, a lot of guys think it's because at the wedding, that's the last time the guy gets to put his foot down. But the reality is, is the broken glass is symbolic of the destroyed temple. And, and, even at, and, the, and we say, in Eshkachech Yerushalayim, what, 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 the, what the groom, the chatan, about to get married, says is breaking the glass. If I forget the O Jerusalem, he says, you know, may my tongue cling to the roof of its mouth. Right hand, forget its cunning if I don't raise Jerusalem above all my joys. It's not because we lost a building. It's because the loss of the temple is a tremendous, it's like the cell tower goes down. Of the 613 commandments that comprise the entire corpus of what is Judaism, with a building, only 369 are applicable, which means a huge chunk of the entire system created by the creator of the universe to give to the Jewish people individually and collectively to build a relationship with God and to elevate themselves and to elevate the world is missing. It's like having a car with your parts. It's just not going to work the same. The whole, the Jewish people individually and collectively in the entire world suffer spiritually from not having that building. Okay, enough said about that because I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back into the history now. So the personal connection that Abraham has is the binding of Isaac story we see. But then we know that Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has the sons, Joseph, he goes down to Egypt. He becomes the viceroy. The Jewish people go down to Egypt. They'll spend 210 years there, going from a family of 70 to a nation of 3 million people. We're fast forwarding through the story now. After 10 years of slavery, Moses comes. He says, let my people go. The Jewish people leave Egypt. That's the Passover story. We have the Exodus. 50 days later, we stand at Mount Sinai. That's the holiday of Shavuot. We're going to be commemorating exactly, basically, a week from today. And God gives us the Torah. We're supposed to enter the land of Israel right away. But unfortunately, because of the spies, because we bad out the land, we had to wander for 40 years. Again, some people think it's because none of the, none of the men would ask for directions, but it's because we bad out the land of Israel. After 40 years, we know, and the whole time, the Canaanites are living in the land in their 31 city-states. That tabernacle is being broken down, schlepped to a different place and reconstructed. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, which is the end of 40 years of wandering, Moses dies. Joshua takes over. And now we leave the Moses behind. We enter the next book of the Bible, the book of Joshua. And the book of Joshua is super important to us because, first of all, it's the story of the conquest and the settling of the land of Israel. And it tells us, it gives us the biblical boundaries of the entire land of Israel. And it all the tribal boundaries because we know that, that Jacob more or less has 12 sons. Each of those sons will become a tribe. And each of those tribes will be given a specific geographic portion of the Israel, which is supposed to be 
preserved in perpetuity. And it's interesting, if you look at a map of Israel, Jerusalem actually sits right on the boundary between what is the largest of all the tribes, which is Judah, which is the host of the country, and the, the, the second smallest tribe of the Benjamin, of, of Benjamin, Benjamin. And the actual dividing line runs right between, right down the center of the Temple Mount. To the north is Benjamin, to the south is Judah. But what we have to appreciate is, from the time that Joshua enters the land, this 14 year conquest and, four, and the seven years of conquest and seven years of settling, Jerusalem is mentioned in the, in the book of Joshua. The Jews f- attack the city, but they are not capable of taking the city or they're not, they don't have, they don't have energy in the manpower to invest it in this as an incredibly heavily fortified city, which means that Jerusalem will remain a non-Jewish city in the heart of a Jewish country for 440 years. Because after the book of Joshua, we're going to get to the book of Judges. And that's 16 different people who act as political leaders of the Jewish people, Othniel ben Kenaz and Samson. And if the best man for a job is a woman, Deborah gets the job. So we got this huge period of time of 440 years. It's like, sorry, Joshua, the guy white watching. It's like we throw the British out of America in 1776, but they say in Georgetown, until 2,276, you know, drinking tea with the queen on the money and flag there for another 440 years. And you can see, ah, there's the map. Exactly. You see Jerusalem over there. So um, yeah. after 400, at the end of this 440 year period of the judges is Samuel. Samuel will appoint the first king of Israel, who is Saul. And Saul will reign for a short period of time. It's during Saul's reign that he will take he will bring David in as one of the generals and commanders of his army. But it's David who will put Jerusalem back in the center of the Jewish world. When King David becomes king, and if you, if you can look at the timeline, you'll see, which is less than 3,000 years ago, King David, when he finally becomes king, he says, now we uh, have a king from whom all future kings will come, including the Messiah, by the way. Now we need a capital city. And if you see in the second in, in the second book of Samuel, which is when the, we get to the second book of Samuel, it talks about the monarchy of David. It says, but David captured the stronghold of Zion. Now remember, it was a fortified city held by Canaanites, the Jebusites until then. David's general, Yoab ben Surya, in an ingenious uh, sneak attack, sneaking through the uh, water system of the city, will sneak into the city. It's sort of like the Jewish version of the Iliad, the Trojan horse story. He sneaks into the city at night, overpowers the guards, opens the gates of the city. King David will conquer the city and and then build his city directly over the Canaanite city, which is the lower part of this hill of Mount Moriah, which if you look in the image there, Mount Moriah is a very elongated hill. The the part that's closest to us in the image is the southern part, the upper part where it says above the Ophel is where the Binding of Isaac story takes place. And notice in this picture, we see that... uh, it is outside It is outside the city limits at the time of King David also. Now, but you look here, look, if you go back to the quote, Second Samuel, David purchased the land, future temple, Mount Moriah. And you see here, it says, but the king replied, he goes into negotiation. It says, Vayomer HaMelech El Aravna. He says that the king says to Aravna the Jebusite, all Jews conquer and buy stuff. You never heard of the Roman Empire buying anything. I mean, the most, most famous military dispatch in human history is probably Julius Caesar writing about 2,050 years ago from Gaul, which is what today is France. Wenny, witty, wiki. I came, I saw, I conquered. We Jews are always buying stuff in the land of Israel. The first thing bought by a Jew, the first Jewish owned real estate in the world is not in Brooklyn, is not in Northwest London, it's not in Bathurst and something in Toronto. It's actually the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron, a burial place for Abraham buys for Sarah. And then he's buried there and all the patriarchs and matriarchs except for Rachel are buried there. The second thing we're gonna, the other thing we buy is, is in Shechem, Nablus of today, a burial plot for Joseph and also Mount Moriah. Obviously the point was not to go into this in Israel, but we didn't wanna follow the normal claim made by all other people that we took it by force and we're big and you're weak and we're strong and you're not. We wanted to show that we legally purchased it. So you can see in the narrative right here, that, but the king replies to Aravna, no, I will buy them from you at a price. I cannot sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels, which by the way is like the Rothschild family fortune back then. He pays prime money for this threshing at the top of the hill. King David will establish 
his kingdom, a united kingdom in Israel, he wants to build the temple. King David, if you read in the book of Samuel, will bring the ark into Jerusalem, dancing before it wildly and sacrificing animals every few feet. It's an incredible story. Because he knows that now that we have this, we, we need a capital city. And because we're not just a nation, we're a holy nation, we need to build our capital in a place that's not necessarily economically the best place. I mean, think about it. Every city in the world that's a major city, London, Paris, Rome, New York, they're on like oceans or rivers, the Thames, the Seine, the harbor of New York. Jerusalem sits in the mountains. It's kind of inaccessible. The hill that Mount Moriah sits on is actually lower than the hills around it, which is why it says in the Psalms, Jerusalem, the mountains surround you, and you stand in the city of David today, which is an incredible national park archaeological site. You see that the Mount of Olives, the upper hill where the Jewish quarter is, are all higher up. But David recognizes that we Jewish people recognize spiritual power, and our capital has to be for spiritual reasons, not just politically in the center of the so King David is, is literally chomping at the bit to build a permanent rebbe because that tabernacle had been in four different locations during that 440 period in Gilgal, Shiloh, Nov, and Gibbon, but not in Jerusalem. Shiloh, by the way, which you can visit, it's an amazing archaeological site. It's a reestablished Jewish community. There's grape fields. I love guiding there. Shiloh of today, you can see the spot where the, where the tabernacle, the Mishkan, stood for 369 years as a stone structure with a cloth roof on it. But... Um, David wants to build a temple. I, we have a capital city. Let's, let's unite that holiest object with that holiest space on the planet Earth, like plugging a very unique you know, appliance into an outlet that will run at peak efficiency. But God says, no, David, it's not for you to do. For whatever reason, David is unbelievable great as he was, and, and God is gaga over David. David is in, 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 in the mind of God and in Jewish consciousness, the ultimate king. He is a he is a political leader, a warrior, a spiritual leader, a prophet, a musician. He is the real, he's the full package deal there. But God says, you have too much blood on your hands. It's not for you to build the temple. It'll be done by your, king, by your son Solomon. So the next phase, when David dies after ruling the Jewish people, he ruled for, for six and a half years, excuse me, seven and a half years in the throne as king of Judah, and then for a period of time as the, for the entire Jewish people he rules, he appoints his son Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech, king over him. Now Shlomo inherits a united uh, mini Jewish empire. It's been one of the only Jewish empires in history besides Hollywood. It's actually not so big, but it expands to the Egypt and to the border of the Assyrian Babylonian empires. And Solomon inherits an empire and has 40 years of peace and prosperity. And Solomon will build what is called the first temple, which is the national building of the Jewish people. You can read the incredibly long description in the book of Kings describing Solomon's building of the temple. It's one of the only things you, you, you literally, it's like, the, it's like a photographic image of what's going on. And this is the zenith of Jewish history. Descendant of King, King David is king, Saul, wisest of all men. Um, by the way, he had, he, he, he marries like an incredible number of women, primarily to make cement and cement political alliances with all the kings of the world and jumpstart the redemption. Here you can see a beautiful, beautiful picture here of what it looks like. You notice now that what Solomon does, David purchased the upper part of the hill, but Solomon will incorporate the upper part of the hill. You can see Solomon's temple right there. He incorporate the upper part of the hill into the city walls and build what's called the temple, which in Hebrew is Bayat Rishon, the first Beit HaMikdash. So now this is four... 40 years after entering the land, we finally have a temple. That building will stand on that site for 410 years. Unfortunately, we know after King Solomon's reign, the kingdom of Israel split into two. We're not, we don't have time to go into that story, but it's like America the, divided in the, in the Civil War between 1861 and 1865. And as Abraham Lincoln said so beautifully, a house divided against itself cannot stand. There's war between the northern and southern, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Twenty different kings will rule the southern kingdom, all descendants of King David. Uh, eventually, the world powers of Egypt and especially Assyria and later Babylon to the east will reexert their control and hegemony over both of these kingdoms. They will whittle away at the northern kingdom, which will eventually, more than a century before the destruction of the of the, of the Jerusalem, the northern kingdom will be destroyed and carried away into captivity. Uh, that's the 10 lost tribes, that great mystery. And until today, there's massive numbers of people of Jewish descent 
around the world who don't even know they are, but descended from those tribes. Um, but the Southern Kingdom will survive for more than three later. But unfortunately, due to the, the sins and the waywardness of the Jewish people, that, uh, that kingdom will come under the control of first the Assyrian and later the Babylonian Empire. And if we go back to our timeline, you can actually see in the timeline that going back here, here we go, let's scroll down. We can see further down, right, Babylonians, about two and a half thousand years ago, uh, the Babylonians, who were already the controlling world power, Israel's a vassal state, uh, the king, the Lang, whose name is, um, whose name is Sedekiah, will revolt against the emperor of Babylon, going against the wishes of Jeremiah the prophet, who's warning him, do not rebate, don't listen. This city is besieged for two and a half years. Tremendous famine breaks out. By the way, when you go to the city of David, you can see clear evidence of the siege and destruction of Jerusalem at this period of time. We even fly and play seals that were used to seal the scrolls, the documents, with the names of the court officials and the kings at this period of time. It's amazing. It's like pulling the Bible and Jewish history out of the ground. But for two and a half year siege where famine breaks out, the city is... The walls are breached and the city is destroyed on the 9th of Av, which is the date when God tells the Jewish people. That's the same date that corresponds to the story of the spies bad-mouthing the land of Israel during the time of Moses. And as a pun, in, we didn't enter the land for 40 years. And God says, you crying on this day for no good reason, I'll get to cry about. It. And we're going to see that almost all the horrible events in Jewish history are going to fall out on that ninth of of date. And this is the first, about two and a half thousand years ago on the ninth of of. And you can see what it says here in Second Kings chapter 25. On the seventh day of the fifth month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, ne Nebuchadnezzar, the chief of the guards, an officer of the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and he breaches the walls and he burns the house of the Lord, the king's palace and all the houses of Jerusalem. He burned down the houses of every noble person. And the surviving Jews are carried away into captivity. That's where the famous psalm, that's to a song I know that Don McLean sang it. Uh, um, there's also a reggae version of it that's done by, uh, I think his name out. Oh my God. Bob Marley, yeah, Bob by Marley. the rivers of Babylon, right. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. So we go into captivity for 70 years to Babylon, which is today Iraq. Jeremiah prophesied the Jewish people will return. During that period of time, the very end, we have the Purim story. But after 70 years of exile, the, the, uh, the Babylonian Empire falls. It's taken over by the Persian Empire. Cyrus the Kisha decrees. And if you scroll down further, you can see over here, this is the famous decree. It says, thus, this is the book of Ezra. It says, it says, uh, thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord God in heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me with him of, of a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So the Jewish people return. This is the narrative described with Ezra and Nehemiah. They come back to find the city in ruins. A few Jews who had assimilated, still living around the area. Ezra comes back and spiritually restraints and unifies the Jewish people. Nehemiah comes back and uh, rebuilds the walls around the city. And the Jewish people built a small little Jerusalem, which is much smaller than the city that was destroyed before at the end of the first temple period, which it expanded away dramatically during that 410 year period of the first temple period. They, they build a cheap little fixer upper temple too. But as the temple is rebuilt and Jerusalem is reestablished, the population will continue to grow and grow just like we see in the modern state of Israel where there's 600,000 people in 1948 living in the state of Israel. And today there are 6.5 million you know, Jews living in Israel, half the Jewish of the world. The same thing will happen with Jerusalem reestablished. And the city will grow and expand. After, after 36 years of Persian control of Jerusalem, Alexander the Great will show up in 331 BCE. Greeks will conquer the land. The Greek empire will split after Alexander's death. It's during this period of time the Hanukkah narrative takes place. Going less than 2,200 years ago, when under cruel Greek Russian, the Maccabean dynasty, the Hasmoneans as we call them, rebel again because the temple had been desecrated by the pagan Greeks. It'll be re-sanctified. But that period of about 100 years of Jewish autonomy in the land under Maccabean leadership, the Romans will be in the year 63 BCE. 
This is the end of the Roman Republic as it's transforming itself into an empire ruled by Caesars. Pompey Magnus shows up, will absorb the land of Israel into the Roman Empire and call it the Roman province of Judea. After that, Rome will turn into an empire and for many hundreds of years after, um, Roman emperors will rule this vast empire, including Israel. It's during that period of time, in the latter half of the first century before the Common Era, that Augustus Caesar, and we're running through this quickly, but this is an amazing period of time in history and archaeology in Israel, will make Herod the Great. Herod is not a legitimate king. He is a descendant of, of Edomites and Nabataeans, right to be king. But he's an ally of Herod. Herod will embark on a massive building project in Israel. He had incredible ego, and he loved to build. He will build Masada and Caesarea Maritina. He will expand, probably to ingratiate himself with the Jewish people, who he cruelly oppressed and who hated him. He will extend the Temple Mount into this massive platform, the largest platform ever built on the planet Earth, which is what we have today, the temple, 500 meters by 300 meters. He will completely rebuild the Second Temple into the largest functioning religious site on the planet Earth. Even the rabbis, who hated Herod said, the house of Herod, you haven't seen the house. And much of the most beautiful archaeology we see in the land of Israel is related to that period of time. When Herod dies, the Romans will go back to direct rulership of the land of Israel. Roman procurators will come in and be oppressive and cruel to the Jewish people. The country is divided. We're, we're, again, we're fast forwarding through the history. We're to the year 67 of the Common Era, and the Jews will, will rise up and revolt against oppression. And this will be the great revolt that the Romans will crush, bringing in four Roman leaders, Titus and Vespasian, destroying the city of Jerusalem and eventually even taking Masada. Um, the second temple will be destroyed in the year 70, having stood for 420 years. So for 830 years, be a temple on that spot. The final decimation of the land is the century after after, at the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt, which is from 132 to 135, when Jerusalem, when the, which is probably triggered, by the way, by the Romans attempting to turn Jerusalem into a pagan Roman city and attempting to build on the ruins of what was the temple, the holiest spot in the world for the Jews, a temple to Jupiter, a total outrage to the people who would rather die than see that happen. This leads to the biggest revolt in the history of the Roman Empire, that it will tell a part of four. Roman legions to crush, the largest revolt in the history of the Roman Empire. When the Romans finish with that revolt, which is the third revolt in 70 years, Jerusalem will be decimated. Most of the land will be decimated. Hundreds of thousands of Jews will be killed. The remainder will be driven out of the country. They will turn the, to a pagan city and ban Jews from living in it. They will change the name from Jerusalem to Aelia Capita. And Jews will only be allowed in the city on one day, on the ninth of Av, because the second temple was also destroyed on the ninth of Av, as was the first temple. On the ninth of Av, Jews could come in to mourn. So and from that period of time, we go into exile. We are almost absent from our land. There was always a few Jews, but we're scattered around what is called the Jewish diaspora. And now our land is occupied by foreigners. Jerusalem will sit in ruins with a Roman, the 10th Roman legion occupying the city. But then if we fast forward out of Judea, um, an offshoot splinter sect, which will eventually metamorphosize into a totally separate religion called Christianity. For, for centuries, the Romans will persecute Christianity because it threatened Roman state religion. But by the time you get to the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine, and by that time, the Roman Empire had split into a Rome and Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. The Roman Emperor Constantine recognized if you can't beat him, join him. And in 324, he will make Christianity, which started out as the, spec, the official religion of the Roman Empire. The status of the city will change dramatically. And the Romans, who are now Christians, from destroyed capital city of the banished most people in the Roman Empire to now Hagia Polis, the holy city. Now, the, the, the narrative in the gospel, if you read in the Christian Bible, doesn't take place so much in Jerusalem in terms of Nazareth and the north of Galilee is where the stories take place. But the final act in that story takes place in Jerusalem. The, the arrest, trial, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection take place there. So in the mind of Christianity, this is an important geographic religious site. Constantine himself was not a Christian. They say he converted it. But his mother, Helena, was a very religious Christian woman. She will come to the city and she will walk through the old city with her Bible and have visions of where everything takes place. The most important site is today a surviving site, the Holy Sepulcher. 
And the Romans will do a tremendous, the Roman Byzantine Empire, which is the Roman Christian Empire, will, unlike the predecessor Roman pagan world, spend a huge amount of money fixing up the city and then turning it into a Christian city with many important churches and holy sites in it. But we have to remember, Rome was viewed as replacing Jerusalem. The Temple Mount was left in ruins and turned into a garbage dump during the Byzantine period to deliberately physically demonstrate God's rejection of the Jewish people because the Jewish people had rejected Jesus and therefore God rejected them, destroyed their city, destroyed their temple, and exiled them to one earth till the end of days. The new Jerusalem was Rome. The New Testament replaced the Old Testament. Sure, Jerusalem is important, but Rome was the center of the Christian world. So that Byzantine Empire will control Jerusalem until the 7th century. In the early 7th century, we have our next period of time, which is the emergence of a huge force in human history, the rise of Islam. The founder of Islam, Muhammad, and his life is centered on the Arabian Peninsula, what is today Saudi Arabia. He will die in six. But Islam, which is not just a religion, but also an empire, will expand dramatically throughout the entire world, starting with the Middle East, absorbing the Persian Empire, North Africa, getting all the way out to Indonesia, Spain in 711, a date all Americans remember because of the convenience store. But in 68, the second successor to Muhammad, whose name is Omar, will conquer Jerusalem. And from 638 onward until 1917, with one exception, Jerusalem will be ruled by various Islamic dynasties. Now, I'm careful with my terminology now, because we take Arabs and Islam together. Islam begins as a religion of the nomadic Arabic-speaking people of the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century. But today, only 30% of all Muslims are Arabs. Okay? Uh, so... But back then, it's basically a nomadic religion of the Arabic-speaking people of the Arabic Silla. So different Islamic dynasties, not necessarily Arabs, will rule Jerusalem from 638 to 19. Umayyads, Ayyubids, Abbasids, Mamluks, Seljuks, Ottomans. How many of them will have a capital in Jerusalem? None. None. Their capitals will be in Cairo, Baghdad, Istanbul, or Damascus. As a matter of fact, Jerusalem is generally an outlying province, often neglected, fringes of many of these different empires, and largely ignored throughout much of Islamic history. The only people to have a capital here, if we scroll down, will be in 1099. In 1099, the Crusaders will show up. Or actually, we should go back from. Well, actually, we'll, we'll go back in a minute because I want to explain the Islamic holy sites, but. In, in 1099, the Crusaders will show up, besiege the summer of 1099, uh, breach the walls, murder about 70,000 Arabs, and burn all the Jews alive in that city, and set up a Crusader kingdom, which will rule till 1187, when Saladin will liberate the city from the Crusaders and return it to Islamic control. But Jamal, if you can go back up again for a minute to the Islamic period there. But what's the Islamic connection to the city? Now, Quran, remember, almost 900 times Jerusalem is mentioned in, 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 in Judaism, and in the Bible, we're obsessed with it. In the Quran, it doesn't appear anywhere. Now, Omar's descendants will establish the dynasty of the Umayyad dynasty that will rule in Damascus and will control Jerusalem to the year 70. A rival dynasty will appear in what is Saudi Arabia of today and claim to be the true leaders of Islam, and they will have within their territory the cities of Mecca and Medina. Those are the really important cities to Islam, the first and second holiest cities. Mecca was converted by Muhammad from a pagan pilgrimage site to the central city of Islam. And now the Umayyad dynasty needs an alternative hope. Now, even though Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran, there is a story in Surah chapter 17 of the Quran which is called Al-Isra wa Miraj. And it's a story of Muhammad's midnight ride on his flying horse, Al-Burak, with the face of a woman, the body of a horse, the wings of an eagle, and the tail of a peacock. And Islamic tradition says that, that Muhammad, in his sleep, will fly on this mystical horse to heaven and have revelation. But the Umayyad dynasty in the late 7th century, needing an alternative holy site, will say, ah, ah, ah. He really flew. And you know where he lands? He lands in Jerusalem on the same spot where the Jewish temple, and therefore it's holy to Muslims too. And therefore, in 691, Abd al-Malik, the Umayyad leader, the Umayyad caliph, will build what's called the Gold Dome, which you can see the image there, which is not a mosque, it's a shrine, which sits in Islamic tradition on the place where, by the way, up until the year 2000, Muslims would have said temple stood. And Muhammad ascended the heaven. Today, unfortunately, due to the geopolitical reasons, there's no 
Palestinian Authority leader, anyone who will ever admit there was a Jewish presence in Israel or a temple in Jerusalem time before Zionism. Um, in 701, they will build the al aqsa which is that black dome you can see in the image there. That is a mosque. It takes its name from the mention of in Surah 17 of the Quran. So what do we get from that in summary? Again, we see like Christianity, it's a holy city. It's connected to the stories in the Gospel of Christian Bible, but it's not the holy city. So here we see that, uh, by the way, initially there's a lot of Islamic pushback against claiming Jerusalem was holy to Muslims. This is not, they said it's not mentioned in the Quran, but eventually it will be accepted. And today in the Sunni Islamic world, this is their third holiest site after Mecca and Medina. For Shiites, it's not. It's Mecca, Medina, and the city of Karbala in Iraq. So if we fast forward through our timeline, because time is running short ourselves, we see that now we understand the Islamic connection. But by the way, when Muslims are up on Mount, even though since 67, you should know, when Israel got sovereignty and control, Moshe Dan hands the keys to the Temple Mount, Judaism's holy site to the Islamic trust. Which is, well, we gave another religion our holiest site. It's like the Pope giving the keys to St. Peter's, you know, in, in, in Rome to the, chief, to the rabbi, you know, in, in, the, in, in the chief rabbi of Rome. Very weird. Um, but but uh, even today when Muslims who pray on top of the site, because they have much more access to the site than Jews, um, when the loudspeaker goes off five times a day they pray, Muslims will turn their back to the Gold Dome and pray south to Saudi Arabia. Well, every Jew in the world is praying towards Jerusalem. Okay, so now we understand that. But let's fast forward back to our timeline. If we can see once more. Go back to our timeline, Shmuel. We got it up there? Here we go. Let's, pass, let's fast forward in our history. Okay, 19, let's just get to the end. The last... A little teeny bit before that, we see the last Islamic dynasty to control the Middle East to the Ottoman Turkish Empire. They will come in 1517. They will control for exactly, exactly 400 years. Um, the Ottoman Empire's final mistake is to side with the Germans and Austro-Hungarians in World War I. And we know who loses that. And during that war, the British are trying to make inroads into the Middle East, especially this part of the Middle East. And in, in uh, November 17th, uh, Arthur Balfour, British foreign minister, to probably get Jewish support, because there's already Jewish settlement in the land, British support, Jews living amongst the Ottomans to support their war effort, the British issued the Balfour Declaration. His Majesty's government looks with favor upon the establishment in mind of a national homeland for the Jewish people. The British are officially backing the return of a Jewish state or a Jewish homeland. And one month later, the, um, the, the you can see right there, this of the the Ottomans the, the surrendering the city to the British, okay? And General Allenby enters the city and the British get control of it. At the Treaty of San Remo in 1920 in Italy, the victorious Allied powers officially give Britain the mandate to control Palestine, contingent on them fulfilling the Balfour Declaration of Jewish State in the entire land of Israel, by the way, without any division of the land, including what is today in Jordan. Unfortunately, not to go into this now because we don't have time, the British will backpedal on their promises and fill them. But this is the birth of Zionism, the first uh, sparks we see of Jewish return to the land of Israel and resettling is taking place at this time. The British mandate will last, of course, all the way through till the end of World War II. Um, during that period of time, we know the British are blocking Jews, severely limiting Jewish access to the land of Israel. Uh, just as Jews are being slaughtered in the Holocaust, you see 1939, on a third of the Jews in the world are murdered by the Germans. Even after that, the British were still keeping Jews out. But if there's any silver lining in the Holocaust, it's the sympathy that Israel got from the world for losing its million Jews. The United Nations will vote November, 27, November 29, 1947 to partition Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. The Arabs reject it, the Jews will accept it. Had the Arab world accepted it, along with Israel, would have been born an Arab state. What it would have been called, Palestine, who knows, we don't know. Um, probably not, because no Arab used the term Palestine until 1965. The Jews before 48 themselves Palestinians, and only in 48 when Israel was born, did they start to call themselves Israelis, the Arabs. Arabs. But with the War of Independence, David Ben-Gurion, on May 14, 19. 1948 calls for peace with the surrounding Arabs. That's rejected. Two hours later, the Egyptian Air Force bombs Tel Aviv. Five Arab armies declare war and invade. The Jordanian army will cross its internationally recognized boundary in the Jordan Valley and attack 
trying to destroy Israel along with four other arms that, thank God, are not successful, but they seize not only all the territory north and south of Jerusalem, which is called Judea and Samaria, um, or the West Bank of today, although I do not like to use that term, they will also get the old city after an intense fight of 12 days right outside my window, literally 20 feet from my window is the war memorial where 48 of the of the 69 people who died fighting in the old city for during those 12 days were buried until uh, 1969 in a mass grave because they were trapped inside the city walls but jerusalem be a divided city therefore from 1948 until 1967 Fast 1967, the Six Day War. Again, this time it's only three Arab armies trying to destroy us. Uh, this is an Israel and a brilliant county, you know, preemptive strike takes out their air forces and wins what is one of the greatest military victories in human history, trashing three armies and tripling it its territory in six days, losing very little men. But by the third day, of the Six Day War, June 7th, 1967, we hear the famous broadcast, Harabait Biadena, the Temple Mount is in our hands. You can see the movie images right here of Israeli soldiers on the Temple Mount. Unbelievable. And again, the, the follow-up to that is Moshe Dayan then gives control of the Temple Mount to uh, the Muslim Religious Trust. Unlike the Arabs who destroyed and burnt to the ground and blew up every synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem after the 1948 war when the Jews lost the city and were thrown out of it, we preserved all the mosques. We didn't destroy any of them. We even gave control of our holiest site uh, to, to the Islamic trust. So it's an incredible story. The rebirth of Israel, reunification of Jerusalem, that's what we're celebrating now. And we've seen that Jerusalem went from a sleepy little border town post 1948 to the largest uh, municipality in the land of Israel. There's close to a million people living in Jerusalem today, a city that is unified geographically through one municipality, but is nonetheless one third population, and a city that is a holy city for all three faiths. And it's only under uh, Israeli sovereignty and Jewish sovereignty that there is true religious freedom. The 19 years Jerusalem was a divided city, the Jordanians desecrated the entire cemetery, the Mount of Olives, destroyed all the synagogues and banned Jews from visiting the Western Wall. So we are commemorating that miraculous rebirth of Israel, but the reunification of Jerusalem, which is unbelievable event in human history. For thousands of years, we Jews said next year in Jerusalem, and now we're this year sitting in Jerusalem. And we've seen that Israel, despite being in the worst neighborhood in the world, surrounded by hostile enemies and in a constant state of warfare, terrorism, economic blockade, with no natural resources. Nonetheless, Israel has prospered, and there's this island of spirituality and, 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 and technology and innovation. And, and it, it's an incredible. It literally is, as the Ministry of Tourism used to say, the miracle on the Mediterranean. The one thing we're waiting for, we go back to the beginning of the story, we understand that Jerusalem is not just a piece of real estate. It's the intrinsic holiness of the spot. And we understand that the mission of the Jewish people has never been to be like everyone else, but a unique nation that's a light to nations. That nation has been physically reestablished, and now we just need to spiritually reestablish it. And that comes with a final completion. The final act in the story, of course, will be the Messianic era, when the temple is rebuilt. And finally, and the Messianic era is a peace for all of humanity. And we know that the beautiful, um, the beautiful uh, uh, quote that I wanted to end with, I don't know, maybe Shmuel can find it there, is the quote from Isaiah, which is where the UN gets its motto from. We had it there about the, uh, yeah, and it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills. We're talking about the temple being established. And all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come and come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and they shall decide for many peoples. And they shall put swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not let neither shall they learn war Amen. anymore. We've merited to see the rebuilding of most of Jerusalem. We're just waiting for that final construction of the building and the, the temple. And then we get peace for ourselves and the whole world. And we should see it soon in our days. That took exactly an hour. I wanted to leave a little time for questions. I'm happy to take some at the end, but there was a lot of stuff in there. And uh, thank you for joining me. It was a pleasure. I, I, um, 
I, I um, that was amazing, Ken. And I just let you go. Uh, I, I want to share with you. Uh, we're officially ended, and whoever wants to leave, leave. We'll stay for questions because we plan for 15 minutes of questions. We're happy to stay. Whoever has to leave, leave. That's fine. There's going to be a recording of this available to all of you. I will send out the source sheet with the recording embedded so you can watch it at about half speed or one quarter speed so you can follow everything. There was a lot of material there and we prepared the source sheets and obviously oh, yeah. Ken added a lot more stuff than it's in the source sheets. I might add some before I send it out. So you'll have some of those sources that he brought up that weren't uh, scheduled. But I, I just want to share with you one little thing. Ken came up here last Thursday, and we, you, some of you saw us going down to the Sea of Galilee. And Thursday evening, when he, he talked to that little part about the Roman destruction and the dispersal of the, of the southern kingdom, and then the Christianity becoming the official religion of the Romans, we sat here with a few lechayims, a little bit of scotch for about two hours, two and a half hours, just with that little, little bit. So um, once we got going, it's, it was really fascinating. So I thank you for uh, concentrating as much as you did. I was very quiet. I was looking forward to schmoozing some of these things and stopping you, but I knew- I if apologize. I, no, if I knew if I did, we would, we would still be stuck back at Abraham and uh, the Akeda, Abraham and Isaac. We, we, we'd still be there. Uh, at the end of an hour, but uh, so I want to open it up for uh, questions for anybody who has questions if Anybody has a question you can unmute your mic. Wow. Look at all the faces here So happy to see you all Anybody have a question? The good news is there's plenty of books on this that you can read including my putting my crash course putting my crash course history so Right, there it is. <laughs> I'll just show I'll just share that with you uh, just for a second um, yeah, I'll bring back. Which has it all there? Uh, yeah, he has a crash course in Jewish history, and you can see it on. Uh, there's ebooks, there's videos. He's got books. Uh, come to his website, kenspiro.com. Browse, and uh, I'll put the link. The link will be in the notes. So if you don't have time to write it down now, uh, the the crash course. How many sections are there? How many segments are there, Ken? Oh, 68 sorry. you can you can access them online and yeah, here's uh, by the time you get to number 63 you get to modern zionism he's on video and uh it's an amazing site that he has and he has all written notes as well these are all the written notes about modern zionism personalities it's all here so uh i strongly recommend you go to his site for that and also <laughs> um next week i'm going to be giving the uh Shavuot, what happened at Sinai? What did the Jewish people get, really? And what that means for us and for the world. And you have to be a subscriber to do that. Most of you here today are subscribers. If you're not, there's going to be a special offer for you to sign up with a special discount. So you'll be able to get every future seminar that we do, whether it's an open guest one or a private one, uh, you'll be able to attend. And uh, this, this is what it was like last year or two years ago on Jaffa Road. This is what Jerusalem Day is supposed to look like when it's not Corona. And the other thing right. we had, we skipped one slide, uh, Ken, that we put up here, which was a significant event because uh, we, there's a symbiotic relationship between the Jewish people, the nation of Israel and the nations of the world. We didn't have time to talk to that too much, how that works and how, how we're to unite and help connect the world to God. And one of the steps towards that is that the non-Jewish nations will start coming to us and wanting to connect to us in Jerusalem. And we had that happen right here in 1993, even though Congress passed, when did Congress uh, pass the law? Oh, they passed the law in 1993. The, the, the law was passed in 93, right. It was, the law was to move the embassy. It didn't happen until 2017. And I didn't have time to get a picture of Ken with David Friedman, the U.S. ambassador in front of the embassy. I couldn't find my picture. You couldn't find <laughs> it. So here is um, two, two Jews oh, okay. in the government of the United okay. States of America. We have an Orthodox Jew uh, in a senior position in the United States government dedicating the embassy in Jerusalem. 
So um, we see that as a very significant event in terms of the symbiotic relationship of Israel and the nations uniting towards a common purpose. So um, yeah, okay, that's that. Let me just unshare. Okay, so now anybody have any questions? Hi, no, it's not really a question. I just wanted to thank you both very, very much. It was uh, fantastic. It's nice that um, I got to see you, Rabbi Beth, and uh, Rabbi Spiro is someone that I've been following for many years now. So I just wanted to first thank Rabbi Spiro for helping me grow in my Judaism. And uh, you've been with me on those audios on the trains and uh, all the videos and stuff. And for yourself also, Rabbi Beth, it'd be lovely to meet you guys one day in Israel. Well, I do have to go. I have to prep some more. So I just wanted to say thank you to you both and thank you everybody uh, for joining and it's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Thanks for coming. I want to mention we really have, this is kind of a really unique, eclectic group. Like I, I, I know who all of you are and a lot of your backgrounds and where you're holding. And I've been teaching uh, 35 years, you too, Ken. I really have not seen this kind of an audience before that's this disparate all coming together to learn together about this topic. So that's pretty, um, it's pretty impactful for me personally. So I just want to thank you all for coming and joining and keep coming back. And I want to thank Ken also for carrying the weight today because I got it off pretty easy. So that was great, Ken. Thanks. Anybody else? <laughs> have a question hey, can you hear me? Hey, yeah there's a, a question that was yeah. posted on the zoom group chat uh, the oh. question from one of your viewers was there a relationship between Shem and Abram since Shem lived five all right so my uh, my blessing for all of you I want to thank you for coming my blessing for you is that the message of Yerushalayim which is to connect the world to the Almighty is that we should all be blessed to feel that, to feel that connection and um, feel that, feel connected to Jerusalem. In, in Judaism, amongst the Jewish people, we say, you know, when you give, um, when you have to help out the community, give charity to organizations that um, you have to first give to your local town. You have to take care of the people in your sphere first, your local town. In Jewish law, we say Jerusalem is always your hometown. So if somebody needs help in Jerusalem, you have to give them help just as much as if it's your neighbor in your hometown, in Jewish consciousness. So uh, my bracha is, is that we use Jerusalem, that uh, we, we're making the steps closer and closer, that we'll all be uh, united. All right, everybody, thanks a lot. If you have any questions, you can always email me, email me or um, message me on Facebook, and we'll be sending out an email. All of you, I have all your emails because you're registered you'll get an emailing with all of the uh, material that we talked today and the video. And next time, invite more friends so we can have more. I have a professional account. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you.